Order members, the sitting is resumed and it's now time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Can I advise members that questions number 1, 3 and 8 have been withdrawn? Uh, Judith Cochran is not in her place. Tom Buchanan is not in his place. I call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. I'm going to come to the call there. We're very quickly skipping up the numbers. Um, I hosted a meeting on the 21st of January 2013 to discuss the issue of wild animals and circuses. The meeting was attended by representatives from the Born Free Foundation, Animal Defenders International, the Captive Animals Protection Society. Since the meeting, I have corresponded with the Born Free Foundation and the Captive Animals um, Protection Society, and my officials will continue to liaise with all of the organisations. I also raised the issue of the use of wild animals and circuses at the North South Ministerial Council Agriculture meeting on the 10th of July 2013, the 13th of November and the 1st of October 2014. Minister Coveney and I agreed that officials would investigate the possibility of an all-island approach to the issue of animals, traveling of animals and travelling circuses and that the findings of the proposals would be reported at a future NSMC agriculture meeting. My officials met counterparts from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine on the 5th of September 2013, even, 19th of March, 24th of July, 29th of September, all in 2014, under the auspices of the North South Animal Welfare and Transport Working Group, and discussed this issue in detail. As there are no circuses based here, DAFM agreed to engage with stakeholders who would be directly affected by any proposals on the use of animals and circuses. That stakeholder engagement, which included several circus operators, local authorities and the European Circus Association, has now concluded and DAFM proposes to introduce a code of practice on the use of wild animals and circuses. My officials continue to work with DAFM officials and we will continue to engage on this issue as it progresses with a view to having an agreed all-island code of practice. I call Stephen Agnew for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer and indeed all the work that she has done on this issue. And whilst a code of practice um, sounds like a way, way forward, even a well-intentioned circus, I don't believe, can meet for the needs of wild animals in the conditions in which circus animals are, are by necessity kept, indeed, through transport, etc., engaging. Um, could I ask the Minister, um, in these discussions on an all-island basis, um, is there any reason why Northern Ireland cannot itself introduce a ban on wild animals and circuses? Um, and if she finds herself in disagreement with her counterpart in the Republic of Ireland, is she willing to act alone? Well, I mean, I've always said to the member that I'm very open to the possibility of banning um, the use of animals and circuses. Um, and I still, still have that position. I suppose the reality is that we don't have any circuses that are based in the north, which causes, a, I suppose, uh, when it comes to creating legislation, we have to make sure that it's relevant and that it's responsive to a need. But given that we don't have a, a circus based here, I think um, the fact that we only have visiting circuses that come from um, um, the 26 counties, but also indeed from across Europe, I think the best um, solution that we have at this moment in time is certainly to develop a very strong protocol that everything's very clear in terms of everybody's very clear in terms of their responsibilities but as i said the work is ongoing the discussions are ongoing and i do, certainly do not have a closed mind to, to moving towards banning um, animals in the future if there was a need that was very clearly identified and you know i know i look at um, what's happening in scotland where they're actually also reviewing the situation and um, wales i believe are moving alongside the same position as england in terms of moving on ethical grounds as opposed to welfare grounds, given that perhaps there's a lack of information around um, the welfare issues. But I hope the members are assured that we'll certainly keep the issue under review. There's certainly going to be an ongoing discussion at NSMC level, but that we will move forward in the meantime with a very strong protocol. I call Sean Lynch. Well, I'll get the last can call you on Gum Greatest done our ass and Fraggle. Shane, I want to thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask the Minister, can she advise what collaborative work has been taking place with the Department in the, in the South, Good. It, it's vital that we take forward this issue um, collectively, given that there are no um, circuses based here in the North. But we do have a number of travelling circuses that will um, be inspected by local councils, because you can 
we'll be aware that all animals um, that are non-farmed animals are inspected under the Welfare of Animals Act, which is um, taken forward from, from local council level. But in terms of cooperation going forward, I've outlined um, quite a number of areas of discussion, engaging with stakeholders and engaging with the department. Officials at working group level are working very hard in terms of um, identifying the need and then bringing forward recommendations, the first of which, as I've said, is around the protocol. But I don't have a closed mind to um, moving towards Bannon if I have um, valid reasons for doing so. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, hands up as someone from a rural area where the highlight of my year was the coming of the circus to our town. Would the Minister agree with me that the circuses of Ireland, the Duffies, the Fawcetts and all the others are about more than wild animals? And can she tell the House if she has uh, directly communicated with those wonderful people who have brought so much joy and so much happiness to children like me when I was a child. <laughs> well, I think we all can admit to enjoying the circus when we're, when we're children. Um, but yes, as part of the ongoing engagement, we have to engage with stakeholders. But none of those circuses are based here, which is, um, means that, in terms of, as I said earlier, if I was going to legislate, I would need to have a valid reason for doing so. Given that, as I said, animals um, in circuses are inspected and, and looked after from the animal welfare officers in local councils. I can clearly say that I think there's, to date there's only been, since that's come into play in 2012, there's only been one case uh, which has been reported to councils. So I think in terms of bringing forward legislation, we would just need to um, take it forward if there is merit in doing so, if there are welfare issues identified. There is always this argument around circuses as whether or not you'd move forward on an ethical basis, which they are doing in England, or on a welfare basis, or both. So, um, but I do have an open mind to it, um, not trying to be a killjoy and ruin any, any child's fun, but I suppose it's just about making sure that if there are valid um, welfare issues, that they are addressed. And, and, and some of the other um, countries I know are looking towards licensing circuses. That's another possible option which could be explored um, over the next wee while. But as I said, the, those discussions are ongoing with um, my department and with DAFM on the 26th. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I uh, welcome the work the Minister has undertaken in relation to this issue um, and uh, heed uh, what she's saying in relation to a code of practice for animals in wild circuses. But would she not accept that uh, the circus is not a place for wild animals uh, and indeed make progress in, with regards to introducing a ban on wild animals in circuses? As I previously said, um, I suppose England have looked towards bringing forward legislation that originally ruled it out, but they're now bringing it forward on ethical grounds. Um, I suppose that's for any minister to decide. I don't have um, the information that I in front of me at this moment in time that would suggest that I feel that we need to move. But I do want to really uh, engage with the, the body of work that's ongoing with my department, with DAFM, around um, talking to stakeholders, around exploring what are the downfalls, what are... Uh, what we can do. I think the protocol certainly is a step in the right direction, but there are, as I said, other areas we can look at around licensing and also, um, as I said in the original answer, I don't have a closed mind as, in terms of bringing forward legislation, but I would have to be assured of the merit in doing so and making sure that there's, you know, that there's absolute justification as to why you would bring forward legislation. Moving on, I call Jim Allister. Question six. In respect of funding allocated for my department under Tact and Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Framework, five GAA clubs received a total of £31,219 funding from the Rural Challenge Programme Scheme. All of these projects focused on community health and wellbeing initiatives. Under Access 3 of the Rural Development Programme, my department has not allocated any funds directly to GAA clubs. However, local action groups have competitively assessed a number of applications under Access 3 where the GAA has promoted a project that also benefits the wider rural community and which was separate from their primary activity. To date, 15 such projects worth almost £3 million have been funded since May of 2007. I would also add that similar projects that benefit the wider community have also been successful from other sporting clubs such as sailing, soccer, athletics and Special Olympics. These have invested over £1 million in community projects on the ground. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the organisations for taking the lead in their communities and for addressing specific community needs within them. I call Jim Allister for supplementary. Yes, uh, with our dairy farmers in crisis, our pig farmers in crisis, our beef farmers in crisis, 
Is it not a scandal that something of the order of several million pounds has been siphoned off to the GAA and some other sporting bodies, much of it modulated money which in the first place came out of the pockets of farmers, and three quarters of a million pounds to perhaps the richest GAA club in all of Ireland near me, Tyrone. Is that not a scandal that funds of that nature are being siphoned off when they should be going to frontline agricultural needs? Well, perhaps the member should educate himself better in terms of the merit and the benefit of what GAA clubs provide in communities, particularly in rural communities. They're very often right at the heart of that rural community. So all the projects that have come forward have been assessed in line with the rules and regulations that have been set out. They have found to be projects of merit and they've been funded accordingly so. I thank all those projects that have come forward. One of the benefits of us being able to do this work is this is communities telling us what they need as opposed to departments telling communities, here's what we're going to give you. So I very much value the work that's been done with um, GA clubs, with soccer clubs, with all the other groups that I've outlined that have benefited from the programme. And I don't think it's fair to pit one against the other in terms of the crisis in the dairy sector. I can assure you I'm doing everything I can to protect and to work with the farmers in the dairy sector who are having such a very difficult time. I can assure you that I'm prioritising getting payments out to farmers in terms of single farm payments and exceeding all our targets. I can continue to do that work. That's all work that's coming out of Pillar 1. Rural development funding, rural communities also deserve support. Rural people who live in, in, uh, deserve support in terms of the community services, the basic services, helping rural businesses to diversify. So uh, right across all those ranges, I don't think it's a, a case of let's play one against the other. Let's support rural communities in their entirety. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, could the Minister uh, outline what factors she considered when allocating funding to the new local action groups? Yes, um, we look very carefully at this again. It's about trying to target that rural need and making sure that money in the rural development programme is targeted at areas of, uh, that, that are actually in need of services, in need of support. Allocations are not just um, based on population. The key factor to be addressed was poverty and isolation. Therefore, 50% of the funds have been allocated on the basis of the top 30% of rural areas with high unemployment and additionally, um, additionally then we looked at multiple deprivation. So we've now announced um, in October time the allocations for each of the lags and I know they're working um, very hard in terms of trying to get the new structure up and running and we hope to be able to open up for projects um, in, towards the end of April, certainly into the start of May. And I look forward to seeing another run of very successful projects that will really benefit and really get into the heart of rural communities in terms of the supports that they absolutely deserve and need. I call Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister uh, for the answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that through the Access 3 uh, of the Rural Development Programme, there was actually a special sample letter within the operating principles or operating rules for the GEA that they could actually apply, but it wasn't relevant for example, to church groups, and church groups have been refused where the GEA were approved. I'm just wondering what the Minister's comments would be on that. The Rural Development Programme doesn't set out to discriminate against anybody, and I can assure the member that church groups have been successful coming forward, working in collaboration with um, other groups in, in rural communities, and I'm very happy to provide that in writing actually the detail of all those projects that did benefit. I can also um, tell the member that we actually fund two posts under rural faith-based um, programmes that actually go out and work with churches groups around trying to um, encourage more participation in terms of seeking rural development funding and other funding for rural communities. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her responses up until now. Um, will the Minister, I'm sure, confirm to me that many of those sporting organisations are just that. They contribute to health, they contribute to education, they contribute to culture and language in their own communities, and, um, including the GAA. But will the Minister um, uh, respond to me just to confirm that those organisations have gone through an evaluation process and that they conform with the actual criteria that's set down for that, irrespective of their backgrounds? 
Absolutely. There's nothing hidden here. All, all these groups that applied, any sporting group that applies, goes through exactly the same process, is assessed by the LAG, which involves um, members from all political parties, involves community representatives and other statutory partners. So it's a very rigorous process which all groups go through. And I, and I again, put on record and, and um, will agree with you in terms of the benefits that, that these groups provide in rural communities. Absolutely second to none. And as I said, the GAA is at the heart of the community. And all the services around health and well-being, around trying to tackle isolation, trying to get um, more people involved in community activities, those are the groups that, um, that actually provide that service. So I'm delighted that they have been successful in the past. And I know that plenty of um, groups in rural communities are actually looking forward to the new programme opening up um, towards the end of April into May. Indeed, so are rural businesses uh, as well, looking forward to the programme opening up for the opportunities that there may be there for them. Alistair MacDonald is not in his place. I call Michelle McElveen. Question line, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Fishing Industry Task Force was established last year to examine issues affecting the offshore fishing fleet. It was agreed that initially the task force would consider the factors affecting profitability of certain fleet segments and the future challenges faced by the fishing fleet and onshore businesses, in particular um, the EU Latin obligation. An interim report was requested to detail priority actions to address these issues. The task force included representatives from the catching sector, the prawn processing sector, the pelagic processing sector, fisheries science, fisheries economics, fisheries policy, producer organisations and active fishermen. The task force met five times last year and I received its interim report on the 14th of January. The interim report, which is available on our website, contains 12 recommendations which I um, shall respond to over the coming weeks. They concern the implementation of the EU fish landing obligation, the launch of the new European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, assessing the capacity of the fishing fleet, priorities for fisheries science and policy for dealing with annual fishery negotiations. The task force has made a valuable contribution to date and there is still much work to be done. I therefore look forward to the task force continuing to work with my department in the future. I call Michelle McElveen for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And just ask the Minister just what discussions have been had in respect of decommissioning or um, scrap and bill schemes. Yes, um, the member will be aware that this is an issue which has been going, going for some time. The task force will be given further consideration to the economies of scale that could be achieved from um, looking at the fishing fleet during 2015. In particular, it will be looking at a report due to be produced by Seafish on the impacts of the landing obligation on both the catching and processing sectors, as well as an assessment that um, will be sponsored by my department on the balance between what's available in terms of fishing capacity and then obviously the fishing opportunities for Irish Sea NAFRAP. So that may lead to a further examination of options to encourage a restructuring process. I call Declan McLear. Uh, Could the Minister give us an update in relation to the inshore, inshore fisheries strategy? I announced the publication of the Dard Inshore Fisheries Strategy on the 19th of December um, 2014, and that strategy focuses on the development of inshore fisheries based on the key challenges facing stake stakeholders such as management of fisheries, improving data, increasing the use of technology, enhancing economic returns and safer fisheries. One of the pro priorities within the inshore fisheries strategy is the creation of a partnership group to inform future inshore fishery policy. My officials have written to industry stakeholders seeking nominations to serve as members of this partnership with the aim of convening its uh, first meeting during March 2015. One of the group's early tasks will be to consider how and which priority key measures within the strategy should be progressed. Given the nature of the work, the group will comprise um, primarily of fishing industry representatives along with environmental, sea angling and public sector representatives. I call Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. The question I was just about to ask is exactly the same. Would the Minister update us on whether the sea bass um, stakeholders are included in the Fisheries Task Force? Because I know they were pushing for it and felt they'd been left out. I, I'll check that for the member and come back to him. I'm not sure. I don't have that information here. Moving on, I call Kieran McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question 10 to the Minister. I'm very supportive of our fishing industry and the contribution it makes to the economy and I'm keen to support the industry through measures um, geared towards helping businesses adapt to the challenges that they face. 
The European Fisheries Fund, which is now closed for applications, has provided funding for projects to encourage new entrants into the industry, as well as enhancing the skills of those already employed in the fishing sector. An example of this was the new entrant training scheme, with over 32,000 awarded to Seafish to deliver a number of introduction to commercial fishing courses. These courses were designed to encourage potential new entrants to the industry and to show them what's involved in a career on board a fishing vessel and to provide the appropriate skills that would assist them should they wish to pursue uh, such a career. Other examples of such grant awards include 46,000 to provide deck and engineering courses and 75,000 to um, support fishermen in obtaining their skipper's ticket. The new um, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund to be launched later this year will provide further opportunities to support the fishing sector and contribute to developing skills and knowledge of the fishing industry. A key objective of the EMFF is the development of professional training, new professional skills and lifelong learning. Specific articles within the EMFF regulations also provide for the promotion of human capital, job creation and social dialogue. My department will consult with the fishing industry to identify the measures required to meet their needs. Through the past support through the EFF and future assistance through the EMFF, I am showing a clear commitment to helping the industry, the fishing industry, develop its workforce. I call Kieran McCarthy I, for something. Thank you, and I very much welcome the response from the minister. Given all that she has said, and I very welcome every item that she has said, issue that she has uh, spoken about. Why is it that the fishing industry is uh, presently find it difficult to recruit particularly new young people into the industry. And it would be a shame that now that there is a glimmer of hope in the fishing industry that uh, it would go back because of the lack of young trainees the coming in. Has asked this question. Thank you. I mean, it is it's obviously a very difficult career. It's a very difficult um, and tough job to be involved with. I think a lot of the work that we're doing is around I suppose giving younger people a, a taster as to what's involved to, to work in that sector and hopefully from that then it will encourage um, new, new um, people to get involved in the industry. I suppose it's a wee bit about um, how can we best forward plan and I think there will be opportunities through the new EMFF fund to allow us to do that. Also what will complement that work is the work that's being done with the fisheries task force because obviously that will identify the future needs of industry and um, where we need to be focusing our efforts. So I suppose a range of things right across the board will hopefully um, assist in creating the situation where we have a sustainable fishing fleet and industry into the future. I call Cahill Boylan. Could the Minister just expand on what support the European Fisheries and Maritime Fund will offer? Yes, um, the, the current fund actually comes to an end, or is it an end now? So this new funding um, package will um, lead us up and support the sector up until 2020. The bulk of the funding is going to go towards supporting the common fishery policy reform and measures to improve the economic and environmental sustainability of the industry. Important areas such as technology to reduce fish disc discards and modernisation of vessels to improve health and safety are a welcome inclusion in the funding pro um, proposals. So quite a range of, of areas of work which, uh, as I said earlier, will um, be taken forward in conjunction with the industry and on the basis of identified need with the industry. Moving on, I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number 11. I'm aware of the differences in pig, or paid to pig producers in Britain as well as here in the north and that a growth in the differential has coincided with a wider downward trend in European pig prices. Whilst this price differential is a commercial matter and my department has no remit to intervene, I'm also aware that the current fall in pig prices is placing our pig sector under considerable pressure and limiting growth opportunities. Pig farming plays a significant role in the agricultural economy here and it's important that we work to help the sector to be sustainable and to build resilience against market volatility. The Going for Growth Action Plan, plan sets out ambitious targets for the local pig sector and I'm hopeful that the sector will meet those targets. I recently met with local pork processors to discuss access to new trade markets, including China and Australia. My officials are working to secure access to those markets, which would hopefully mean greater returns for the pig sector. It is also hoped this would mitigate against price fluctuations and contribute to growth in the sector. In addition, a key recommendation in the Going for Growth Action Plan was the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, which is currently being developed under the New Rural Development Programme, and that will also assist our local pig sector to take advantage of current and future market opportunities. I call Claire Sutton for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Um, does the Minister have any plans to appoint an independent veterinary expert to provide strategic oversight of the health of the pig herd to ensure effective growth? 
I'm happy for the, the member to write to me to talk about that. I know it's an issue that's been raised um, on a few occasions in the past. I'm certainly keen to do everything that we can that protects the interests of the pig sector. We're actively pursuing um, additional markets, which will obviously help in terms of the price issue. Export growth is what we're targeting. We're disappointed that we haven't had the recent visits from the Chinese officials as yet, but we're hopeful that that will happen um, certainly over the next number of months. And if needs be, I have um, assured the industry that um, I will also go to China and seek political meetings if, that's, um, if that will improve um, and I'm supposed to speed up the time frame in terms of those inspections going forward. But we're also looking towards the new markets. Um, Australia is another market which the local industry is very um, interested in. So I, th I suppose in terms of trying to um, create those new market opportunities alongside working with the industry around the advisors that we have on the ground, then I think a combination of, of issues will hopefully see the industry through um, what is a difficult time for them at this moment. I call Joe Byrne. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for answers. Given that uh, people are involved in pig production have two major bottlenecks, i.e. the price of pig meal feeds and also the pressure from the banks, can the Minister give any reassurance or encouragement to the pigmen in relation to talking to the feed suppliers and the banks to give them some space? Yes, uh, I met the banks just um, before Christmas in terms of um, asking the banks for some compassion and flexibility, initially in relation to the dairy sector, but obviously it's relevant right across the board. Um, the pig sector obviously in difficulties at this moment in time too. So, uh, Whilst I can't do anything in terms of the market issues which lead to price, we can um, chase after the new markets, which I've said. But alongside that, then, it's about what we can do in-house in terms of assisting the industry. And I can assure the member that we'll continue to do that. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Given that pig prices in Northern Ireland are currently running about 20p per kilo, uh, less than the current UK price, and does the Minister uh, accept that this is a totally leaves our producers at a big disadvantage? And therefore it is uh, unacceptable. I am aware of the difference between the price paid for pigs in Britain and, and here in the north and the fact that that gap has actually grown um, with local processors dropping their prices by obviously a, quite a greater degree in terms of the, the standard pig price. But as I said, the, the price that farmers are paid for the produce is a commercial matter and the department doesn't have a remit to intervene on that issue. Um, nevertheless, I believe that farmers, and I have always made this very clear, should receive a, a fair price for their produce. And I encourage all elements of the supply chain to work together in order to mitigate fluctuations and facilitate um, sustainability in terms of local farming, particularly in relation to the pig sector. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister has uh, touched on this issue, but I wonder could she uh, provide an update on the progress of the audit from the um, Chinese authorities with respect to the pig industry? Yes, at a, at a recent meeting with the pig industry on um, 19th of January, um, I advised them that we um, were initially expecting the visit to be um, last week, but that's been postponed. So we have engaged with the Chinese officials at a political level in China in terms of trying to secure that engagement. We've been told it will certainly be over the next number of months. We're also um, delighted to host a delegation from Australia uh, in terms of looking towards um, opening up that market for us. So we're coming at it from a number of angles. But I know certainly the industry here has um, great disappointment in the fact that Chinese officials haven't um, been here yet in terms of the inspections, given that they're all in a state of readiness and, and very happy to open their doors to show um, the safe and secure practices that they have. So we're hopeful of securing access to these markets. I certainly do all I can at a political level in terms of trying to encourage the Chinese visit as soon as possible. And um, I'll obviously keep the industry up to speed in terms of um, any developments we have in relation to that. Moving on, I call George Robinson. Question 12, Deputy Chair. I can advise the member that, as I've um, reported previously, I've met with Minister Kennedy to discuss transport issues at the site. A transportation assessment is currently being undertaken at the site, and this is expected to be completed by the end of this month. My officials will continue to liaise with colleagues in DRD to consider all the transport implications of the move of my department to Ballykelly. I call George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Deputy Chair, would the Minister agree that a real halt at the very welcome re relocation of dead Dard headquarters to Ballykelly would be a big, big benefit to the travelling workforce? Absolutely. I think it would be a tremendous asset. I suppose it comes down to costings and um, affordability and timings on the track, but certainly it's something that's been raised with, um, with me um, 
not least by Kehalo Hashin also in the past. Um, we have discussed it with DRD, with um, Minister Kennedy, and officials are continuing to do this piece of work. I look forward to getting the report at the end of the month, just with, that will give us a bit more detail in terms of if and how it can be progressed. But certainly, I would agree that it's, it would be a tremendous asset in terms of um, assisting the, the move to Ballykelly. I call Claire Sugden. Um, thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister if she is aware of any community voluntary groups who have expressed an interest on uh, working within the site alongside uh, the Department? I don't have the list um, of, of groups that have um, expressed an interest. I know there was quite a considerable interest. Um, they responded to um, OFMD FM survey in relation to what, what else. So I think the fact that we announced our move obviously led the way for other groups to want to come forward. I've been told, and I intend to actually visit the site um, very shortly, and I've been told that there's quite a large number of community and voluntary groups that are interested in meeting with me and discussing the potential for them on the site, so I'm very keen to explore that. And that is our, the end of the time for listed questions to the Minister. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Thomas Buchanan. Mr. Uh, Speaker, and can I first of all apologise on missing question four, and that I was uh, meeting with the Minister uh, for Dale and wasn't able to be here. But can I um, ask the Minister to explain the apparent discrepancies in the 2013 TB reactor figures? Uh, in April of 2014, those figures showed there were 8,271 reactors. In September of the same year, they showed there were 8,392 reactors. And earlier this year, they showed there were 7,502 reactors. There's a bit of discrepancy there. Can you explain why that is? Well, I don't have those figures with me, so I'll have to pick it up with the member in writing. I, I can't respond to, to those figures because I don't have them. I call Tom Buchanan for supplementary. Okay. But uh, can we ask the Minister then how we can have any confidence in a system that is uh, currently being used where, uh, on a, in a battle against TB where the figures, there's so much discrepancy in the figures for one year only? You're suggesting there's a discrepancy in the figures. I would need to take a look at it to analyse it further. But I can assure you that we have an um, EU-supported, um, very firm um, programme in place in terms of TB eradication. I can assure you that I'm committed to trying to eradicate that disease. The member will be aware that there's no simple solution. There's no quick fix. It's not a simple disease to solve. Um, but we're certainly, um, through the work of our EU eradication plan, but also through the member will be aware that I've established a TB strategic partnership, which is um, all the key... Um, industry representatives coming together around what is the next stage, what is the, what is the next approach we have to take. So we're certainly not taking our eye off the ball in terms of trying to eradicate this disease. We have seen the figures come down year, year on year, not nowhere near as fast as we'd want, but at least we have that downward trend. I hope that continues, but I can, as I said, I can give the member an assurance that we're certainly working very hard to eradicate this disease and have us in that position, which will obviously open up new markets for us again in terms of the trade opportunities that we're trying to explore. I call Jimmy Spratt. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister uh, what discussions she has had with um, her officials from Rivers Agency, with uh, the DRD Minister uh, and uh, Northern Ireland Water in relation to the Dunmacken uh, project in my constituency in South Belfast to alleviate the flooding problems in Sicily Park and the Greystone area of South Belfast? Yeah, the work in South Belfast is quite a, a large volume of work around Sicily Park, Upton Park, um, all the other areas. I'm just going to try to get you the specifics on the area that you're referring to. But certainly um, at Orchardville, Rivers Agency has completed maintenance and upgrading work and continues to monitor the situation. In Sicily Park and Grace, uh, Town areas, Rivers Agency is working in partnership with NI Water in the development of a scheme to upgrade existing infrastructure, subject to secure an agreement with landowners. It's hoped that to, that we'll be able to commence the first phase of that scheme in the summer. Rivers Agency has also taken on responsibility for three privately owned urban drains in the Sicily Park area. At Upton Park and investigations by NI Water, Transport NI and Rivers Agency are ongoing. So I hope that covers the area you're talking about. If not, I'm very happy to provide the member with an up-to-date position. But there's certainly quite a lot of body of work going on in South Belfast. And a lot of the work that's being taken forward is being taken uh, forward um, right across all the structures with NI Water, with DRD, with, um, with my own department and Rivers Agency. But I'm happy to give the member and write in any other detail that he needs. I call Jimmy Spratt for something. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister uh, for her answer? But could I ask the Minister uh, to have or to instruct her officials to have urgent talks 
with officials of Balmore Golf Club in relation to the river that runs through their park. They have been treated by both DRD and Northern Ireland Water at present in a most disgraceful way uh, and will cause serious problems to the business, uh, employing some 80 people uh, within uh, the, the uh, golf club area. Uh, and it must be very sympathetically looked at by everyone concerned. Yeah, um, just NI Water is leading on this game for Sicily and, and Greystown areas, and they are in negotiation with Balmoral Golf Club, as you, you referred to, regarding the storage of flood water within the club grounds. Um, I'm told these negotiations are at an early stage and subject to the agreement with the club that NI Water hopes to commence that scheme in the summer. But I'll take on board what you said and make sure that I relay that through my own officials in terms of their engagement with that project. I call Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister um, if there's any uh, progress reports you could give us on the, the restoration of the Modiolus or horse muscle beds in Strangford Lock? Yeah, yeah. Yes, the work is ongoing. I'm trying to get you an update. Horse muscles. Um, in terms, I don't actually have the detail. I have to write, write to you to give you more detail. But the, the plans, the restoration plans are in place. Europe are happy with our approach to it. The Ulster Wildlife Trust are happy to our approach to it. It's about us trying to protect the, the, the horse muscle itself and create a situation where it's sustainable for the future. It's also about trying to sustain those um, pot fishermen who have been working that, that area for such a long period of time. So I suppose it's, it was always about trying to get a balance in terms of how we, uh, we take it forward. Um, but if there's anything else to add to that, I'll certainly provide it to the member. I call Trevor Lund for supplementary. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Minister, for that uh, positive response. Um, could, could she advise us uh, in, in terms of possible European action against us for infraction? Are we on course to avoid that, or if, if we're not, how much is it liable to cost? Yes, we're on course to avoid that, um, if we haven't already avoided it. Um, the plan that we produced and, and forwarded to Europe, they were content with and happy with. And as, as, as I said, it's a, a plan that commanded, I suppose, support right across all those people that were, had an interest in the horse muscle and, and in Strangford Lock. So I, I believe that we've avoided the, the potential um, scenario where we would face fines. I call John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I note that the Minister met with uh, Ulster Farmers Union and local banks um, before Christmas. Um, she will also be aware of pressure on a huge drop in, in milk price and difficulties in other sector, cuts to single farm payments. Was there any progress made at, the, at that meeting indeed since with regard to banks dealing with overdraft facilities and even looking at capital holidays for farmers? Yes, as you rightly said, I've met with the, the six main banking organisations along with the UFU in December and it, it was a very positive engagement. It was a very positive meeting. Um, what I asked for and what UFU asked for was flexibility, was for a bit of sympathy um, and a wee bit of, uh, well, certainly a more proactive approach in terms of the banks actually approaching their farm customers around the difficulties that they're facing. Um, in terms of follow-up from that, um, the banks were then, as I said, to go and proactively have that engagement and over the last number of weeks I've actually written to them to ask for an update in terms of where we're at with that and, and any progress that they've made. But I mean, you've referred to the issue of capital payments and I suppose there's there's arguments for and against that. Um, some farmers would, would like to see that, but I suppose in the longer term it can maybe sometimes increase penalties and fees to further down the line. But, but that's not to say it won't suit everybody, because some farmers that will very much um, suit them at that moment in time. It's really about having the options. So my, my role in terms of engaging with the banks was certainly about them being very open, very flexible about working with, with our industry. And I think that, um, just to say to the member also, that we are, through CAFRI, are currently planning a series of meetings um, with local back, bank representatives to help farmers deal with cash flow issues. So that to me is a very positive thing because it's something that just given the volatility that we have, managing cash flow is a key issue which farmers need to be um, dealing with. So I'm very happy that we'll be able to do that piece of work along with our CAFRI advisors and, and the local banks. I call John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister uh, to, for a reply. Uh, the Minister quite rightly identified uh, issues around cash flow. I'd also draw the Minister's attention to an investigation by the Competition and Markets Authority into banking um, and asked has she had any input into that, given the importance of the agri-food sector in Northern Ireland, and if she hasn't had, would she endeavour to do so? 
Yes, I haven't been invited to, to give any evidence, but certainly I, I'd be willing to give evidence. You're right, absolutely right. It's about, this is about fairness in the supply chain. This is about us supporting farmers um, through a very difficult time. So if, if the situation arose, I'd be very happy to go along and, uh, to that inquiry and actually give evidence in terms of the impact that it has here locally. And, uh, and maybe I could take that suggestion up from, from the member today. But this is certainly about champion fair treatment of farmers is certainly about making sure that that fairness exists right across the supply chain. And I welcome the moves in, um, from DEFRA in England this week around the groceries adjudicator, around giving them actually additional powers. That's something that obviously we all will welcome and something that industry said from the, or had said from the start that they were concerned that it didn't have enough teeth. This certainly would enhance what they're able to do in terms of imposing fines in supermarkets. So it's obviously something that's um, very valuable for the industry. So we'll watch that with keen interest and, and we'll feed into the discussions in terms of the development of that legislation. Edwin Putz is not in his place. I call Ian Milne. Can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the actual support uh, which will be made available to young farmers under the, the cap reform measures? Yes, the, the Young Farmer Scheme is a mandatory component of the direct payment support framework and that scheme is going to be financed by reserving um, up to 2 per cent of the direct payments budget ceiling for this purpose. I mean, I'm delighted that we're able to bring forward the Young Farmer Scheme. We all know about the age profile of the farming industry and how we need to change that. Certainly we've had um, over, over the course of the CAP discussions and, and the fact that we have been able to announce the Young Farmer Scheme, a considerable number of young farmers, over 2,000 actually, have um, enrolled in our CAFRI courses. So that shows that um, there's quite a number of young farmers out there who actually are head of holding and are working in partnership with um, their family farm business. So I'm delighted that um, we'll be able to provide that, um, that, that, that support for, for those young farmers. And just to say, whilst I am on my feet, that this week we'll actually be publishing um, further guidance in relation to firming up and giving people the information that they absolutely need in terms of um, deciding why not they're a young farmer, the types of evidence that the department will be looking for. So it's really about providing um, the last wee piece of the jigsaw in terms of more information for those young farmers to make decisions when it comes to making their claim for single farm payment in May. I call Ian Milne for supplementary. Kerma, I got last call call your August my week as to an era down the fragri a hugchi kaji show. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answer that she has given uh, to this point. Uh, will young farmers also qualify for, qualify for support under the proposed farm business improvement schemes? Very good. Yes, um, they'll actually benefit in terms of the grant aid, and we're still working up the, the um, ins and outs, the more, the more detailed aspects of the farm business improvement scheme. But we do hope to open it up later this year. The grant aid that we'll be providing to all farmers is 40%, but in order to, again, um, support and enhance um, the, the investment and efficiency around farms, particularly from young people, we uh, um, will increase that um, grant aid to 50%, so an additional 10% for young farmers. I know this is something that's been very much welcomed by um, young farmers clubs and, and certainly in engaging with young farmers, it's something that they're very keen to explore and take them on hopefully be able to bid into in the future. Oliver McMullen is not in his place. Uh, members, as the next period of question time does not begin until 2.45 and we have completed our topical questions, I can only suggest that we take our ease for a few moments until 2.45.